I'm, I'm just going to kind of start with, I am just a hobby farmer. There's probably a lot more qualified people than me to talk about chickens, uh, but they weren't free. <laughs> it's March break. So everyone I asked was away or they had other plans. So uh, you're stuck with me today. Um, we've done chickens. I, I, as far as I grew up with chickens, so it's just kind of second nature. So um, hopefully most of this information is correct. Um, the very last page of your handout uh, has, I didn't take it up here, uh, chicken terms. So there's, I, I gave you a bigger list, but some of the terms, just so that we're kind of all on the same page, um, because chicken is a kind of broad term, a uh, chicken is uh, a, a bird, right? So then we're talking, what ones we have? A hen, a mature female, a layer is a female bird kept for laying production. Uh, a cockerel is a, ma a male under 12 months. Um, I'm sure they're fertile, but you want to make sure you have an older male to make sure your fertility is higher. A rooster or a cock is a mature male over 12 months. Pullets, um, a lot of times like when you're buying chickens, they're referred to as pullets. Uh, that is a chicken term. Uh, so it's a young chicken, less than one year. Uh, so, and then they can either become hens or uh, a baby chick is a chick that just hatched usually one to seven days, broiler or fryer. You've probably heard like roaster, broiler, fryer. So those are like meat variety birds. Um, and you can eat any kind of chicken. You don't, it doesn't need to be like a meat bird. Um, any, anything you have is good. So, well, I feel like, okay. So this is in your handout as well. I didn't know that I had that next. Um, so you can, it kind of gives you an idea of all the different chickens. I'm not going to dwell on this cause you can look it over. Cause I have a lot of people like, well, what kind of chicken do I pick? Um, this is a great one. Okay. I'm missing like, anyways. So before you get started with chickens, you are going to want to do a little bit of research. First big one you want to do is make sure you can have chickens. Uh, how many of you guys actually have chickens already? Oh, lots of you. Perfect. Um, so if you live in town and sometimes even just outside of town, you, there might be bylaws against chickens. So you kind of want to know that before you get investing in this. Um, that, that's a really big one. Uh, and then you, you kind of want to know, we're going to go through a bunch of different things, but you're going to want to research like how much space you're going to need. Do you have the space? Um, do you have a place to get rid of poo? Cause chickens make lots of poo. Um, if you go away on vacation, somebody's, it's like a dog, like it's not even really like a dog, a dog you can take to a, what are those called? Retreats or kennel, there you go. Um, you need to, to feed and water and collect eggs every single day, you can't just leave it. And they're sociable creatures. Um, you can't have just one chicken, it will probably die. Um, I do recommend like three or four, just in case something happens to one, uh, but you, you have to have more than one chicken, otherwise it's just cruel. Um, okay, so the benefits of having your own chicken, some of them are, are pretty obvious. Um, meat and eggs is really a, a huge benefit. Um, what, but another thing that's really great is they'll actually eat all your kitchen scraps. So instead of throwing stuff away, uh, and we'll go over like what kitchen scraps they can eat, um, but they'll eat, they'll, they eat a lot. They, I mean, you can feed them meat. I can't feed them chicken. I just can't bring myself to do that. But pretty much anything else, um, though I, I'll give them eggs, so don't give them a whole egg. Again, we'll cover that afterwards. Um, they create compost for your garden. Chicken poo is really, really good for your garden. Um, so it's they're eating your scraps and then creating good stuff for you as well. Um, and they're just entertaining, like actually really entertaining. We love to sit on our back deck in the summer and have our coffee and just watch. Well, we have like chickens and ducks and guineas between them all. There is no shortage of entertainment. Um, and then you kind of want to research like, what are you actually looking for in a chicken? Are you looking for a meat bird? Are you looking for just eggs? Do you want to have dual purpose where you can breed them out and do both? Um, some chickens have better temperaments than others. Believe it or not, they are characters. They have their own personality. Some of them are very friendly, some of them are not. Um, and you kind of learn all that stuff. Um, and you kind of want to make sure that the, the breed that you're looking at is good for our climate. We live in Canada, it gets hot and it gets cold. So you want to make sure you have a, a bird that can handle that. Um, 
And there's some really fun, fancy breeds. If you start like Google, like fancy, fancy chickens, there are some hilarious looking breeds. So if you're looking for entertainment, you can do that as well. Um, or just plain ones. And honestly, I don't know. I remember Pastor Nate saying one time that, I think it was Jan Mulder that was talking about how, how beautiful his cows were. It, you get, you'll be that crazy chicken lady that you're just like, this is, I know, Donna's got the crazy chicken lady shirt, but you'll like have your favorite chickens and uh, prefer some breeds over others. Um, and then another really good question is, um, how are you gonna get your chickens? Are you, are you buying eggs to hatch out? Do you want day olds? Do you wanna have ready to lay hens or slightly older hens? So um, knowing what you wanna work with is probably a good idea. So first thing we're gonna talk about is where to get your chickens. Um, because there's lots of different places. Um, the, the most common kind of is like a feed store because uh, it, it's easy and accessible. So I did bring, um, Elgin Feed has given me some flyers. They're up here on the table. I'm just kind of keeping them all in the same spot. Um, those dates are wrong, by the way. I just found a photo online. So don't look, these dates are correct on here. Um, so you can actually go and order your birds. Um, I live right by Oxford Feed, so in the past I've ordered from Oxford Feed. And generally how these come is you're gonna place your order and they're gonna call you when it's in and then they're gonna hand you a box like this, even if there's 75 chicks. Like, it's crazy how many chicks you can fit in this tiny little box. So I always think it's crazy. And then this is the brooder, one of the brooders that we use. Like, it's just... I don't know, I think it's considered a rabbit pen or whatever. You can literally use a cardboard box. So um, you don't have to go through a feed store. Uh, the, like, honestly, we have the internet. Go on Marketplace or Kijiji or whatever. I'm sure you can find lots there. And then there's always the ask a friend. Um, ask around. Someone has chickens, see if they have any that they're looking to part with. See if they have eggs that you can hatch out. Uh, or if they're hatching out chicks. Now you know a guy who hatches out a lot of chicks. Normally we have to like rein him back and be like, okay, no more. He's really excited that this is done though because he, he is picking up turkey eggs today. So he's like, I gotta set up my incubators. So we'll, we'll get there. Um, okay, so a couple different ways you can order, if you're gonna order your chicks, a couple different ways you can do that is you can order day old chicks that are gonna come in the box. And you can order ready to lay hens that are generally like 16 to 20 weeks. And that's about when they start, 16 to 20, 18 to 22 in there, that's when they're gonna start actually laying eggs. So you can buy those as well. So you're probably thinking like, well, how do you pick? It depends. Like, do you wanna raise up your chicks and handle them and, and, and go through that? One, it's just kind of fun. Two, if you have kids at home, they love it. Um, but then, like, they're not really pets, but they're kind of pets, right? They get used to you, you're handling them, they're seeing you, they equate you with food, so now they're, you're their best friend. Um, however, you need to feed them to get them to 16 weeks, right? So you're gonna pay less for a chick, but then you need to feed it to get to a layer, um, or you can buy a ready-to-lay, hey, ready-to-lay layer hen, there we go, that makes way more sense. Um, and it's gonna be a little bit more, but you're gonna get eggs, right? Like if you can wait for your eggs. Um, I personally like doing the chick route because I like knowing what's going into my birds. Um, I choose uh, like organic non-GMO feed, so I don't know what they've been fed up until that time. It's completely up to you. Um, you can also get a mature laying hen, and generally you're not gonna be able to order that. That's if you're going to somebody else who has them and, and kind of asking around, um, you know, do you have any extra hens? Um, we have a couple friends, <laughs> one in particular, that he has a barn, and he, he has sheep, but he has chickens upstairs, and they, he's like, I, I just found more chickens. I found more chicks. They, they just keep going broody and having more chicks, so if we need more birds, we just go to him. So if you're looking for birds, <laughs> we, we can hook you up. Um, so, but there is a buyer beware when you're gonna buy older birds. Like if you're gonna buy day olds from a hatchery, generally it's pretty, it's a pretty sterile environment, it's pretty clean. Uh, same with eggs, like you can get dirty eggs and wipe them off, don't wash them, but wipe them off and put them in your incubator. But if you're getting um, like a ready to lay hen 
or a mature hen, you really want to know where it's coming from. If it's coming from generally the hatcheries and stuff, um, well, it wouldn't be the hatchery, it'd be the next stage up. The, the, they're normally okay, but then when you start going to other people's farms and, and buying off other people, you don't really know how healthy their flock is. You kind of want to go look and see, make sure everyone's looking perky and moving around well and healthy because um, you don't want to be bringing any diseases back to your flock because you can bring like respiratory diseases or parasites or mites, um, all of which are not a lot of fun. You can deal with them. Um, but then Jaden had mentioned too, when you're going to get uh, new birds in, you just, you want to keep them separate for a bit. Um, kind of have them, we like to do it in a separate pen just outside our chicken pen so they can actually see each other. They can, if you want to keep them a little further away at first, you can. And you just want to monitor them for about a week, make sure that they're good and healthy um, and that they're not bringing anything to yours. And then you want to introduce them. There is actually a thing as a pecking order, like that's a real thing. Um, so throwing a whole bunch of chickens in with your chickens probably isn't a really good idea. You want to introduce them first um, and make sure everyone's good with each other. If they're not, you'll know because you'll have a rooster or, or a hen flying up against the fence at another one. Uh, so you want to make sure they're doing okay and nobody dies. So um, yeah, so moral of the story, know where they're coming from. Now going to raising chicks. I don't remember at all. Oh, okay, so if you're gonna order birds, these are generally the kind you're gonna order from the feed store. So they have the white rock broiler. That is your typical meat bird. It's uh, a barred rock and a Cornish hen cross. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about meat birds as well. Um, and then there's a couple different other versions. There's white turkeys that you can order and then the Muscovy ducks as well. So th those are the typical ones you can order through the feed store. Um, most, like all of them are available as chicks. Some of them, normally I think the Isa Brown are the ready to lay hens. So they don't have all of them at ready to lay ages. Uh, yeah, yeah, so um, uh, Elgin Feed has the Isa Brown. Those are the only layers that they sell. So anyways, those are what we have there. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about raising chicks, because this is typically how a lot of people get them. They, they order in your chicks. So you're gonna come home with a, bo a box like this, um, and then you gotta put them in a brooder of some kind. So I just pulled some uh, off the internet. You can get as creative as you want. Just keep in mind that they do grow. So you will have to have, like this is great for the first couple days, and then you do need to get more space for them. So what we typically do is we have our little brooder here. Um, we have a brooder plate. I'll be really fast. I'm not moving Ryan, sorry. I walk out of the frame. Okay, so this is a brooder plate. Jaden talked about it a little bit. Um, a lot of people do like heat lights. Uh, heat lights freak me out. Um, they can break um, and then have glass down. They can burn and they can start fires, um, in my opinion. They, they just freak me out. So these are brooder plates that you can buy. Um, they literally are adjustable. You just push the little button and then the legs move so you can have it set up. Hold on. You just plug it in and then this plate here gets warm. It doesn't get hot, you can still touch it. I know this isn't level at all, but I'm not going for perfection here. And then you're gonna put this, this is horrible, but anyway, I could have had this reset. Uh, or preset. So you're gonna put that in, in your pen. Actually, that works. Um, and then you're gonna put your chicks in it. And you can do it on angle so that the taller chicks can go where, and, and the smaller chicks can go to the back. But they're gonna kind of huddle under there, kind of like a mother hen. Um, and you, like we have a couple of these because we normally do bigger batches. Um, but then they'll just kind of run in and out. So you're gonna put the brooder on one side and you're gonna put the food and water dishes on the other so they have to leave and kind of run around. Um, I, I really love these. They are a little bit pricier, uh, but to me it's a one-time investment. I do find um, heat lamps can get expensive and they just burn out. So um, I love, love these. Everyone has their own preference. So, and then Jane had talked a little bit about feeders and waters. You can just buy these bases 
and I just use a mason jar. We do have, oh, there's water in there. I had to wash them all, they were really dirty. Um, you can get them with the plastic. We break every single plastic thing we have, every time. So I just go, the mason jars are nice and sturdy and strong, so you can buy whatever you want. And I like, with the mason jars, I can always see how full it is, how much water is in there. Um, and then a feeder, you wanna, depending on how many chicks you have, you wanna have a feeder that all of them can get around them at the same time or they will die because they'll just like dog pile each other. They're super smart animals. Um, so this one, you just pop it open, pour your feet in it and they'll put their little heads in or they'll crawl through it. Um, and then I have metal ones as well, but the, the plastic is nice and easy to clean uh, for the chicks. Um, and the really big important thing, Jane had touched on that too, you don't want it too hot or too cold. Um, cardboard box, I don't love the idea. You can see the food and waters on one side and the brooders on the other. Uh, there's a lot of corners. They love to go into corners and then the next one loves to go and then um, th that's how you're gonna lose your birds. They will literally dogpile each other and the bottom ones will just die. So it's a really good idea to not have corners. If anything else, just put a little piece of cardboard in, in the corner so that it's not a tight corner and that'll solve lots of it. But you can see like a lot of people choose to do round or, or octagon type things. Um, so there's just not as many places to squish each other because if they can find a place, they will. Um, they're not as dun dumb as guinea chicks, but they're dumb enough. So um, yeah, and the, the nice thing about um, if you do a red heat light, um, it's not always the case, but if you have a chick that has a spot on it or it has a little red, red spot or cut or anything, they will just kill it. They'll just, ev everyone will go up to it and peck it to see what the spot is. And you know, if you have 20 or 30 birds, that bird's going to die. So if you have a red light, they actually can't see the spot. So then you have a lot less issues with pecking. Um, so that, that, that is a benefit of the red heat light, but you can actually just put a red light on. And you don't always need it, uh, but it does help. Um, now the feed you're gonna give them, you're, you're gonna clean their water every single day, but you're gonna give them, it's called starter. It's pretty self-explanatory. There's a starter, a grower, and a layer. And, and a finisher, but like generally, if you're doing like egg laying birds, that, that's how you're gonna do it. You're gonna start them on starter, a couple weeks in, you're gonna move them to grower, that's gonna help them grow, and then once they start laying, you're gonna give them layer, because it has a different protein content. So, um, and they definitely need draft free, because if, it's, if they start getting cold, they will, they'll die. Um, so when they feather out, uh, which is normally like, four to six weeks, depending on meat birds are a different beast, we're gonna cover that in a sec. Um, then you can start lowering your temperature and you can start introducing them to outside. One of the reasons most people start doing chicks in the spring is because you know you're gonna have a month with them inside. So whether they're in the house or the garage or the basement or in a barn, as long as it's like they have their heat source and it's, there's no breeze coming through making them cold, you're not gonna put them outside until like four to six weeks anyways. Um, but once they go outside, you, you want to make sure it's not freezing because they're not acclimated to that yet. Um, and then, again, if they're, uh, I will get questions. Uh, if they're um, layers and they're going to go into your flock, you want to acclimate them like you would a new bird. So you want to have them, we have, um, like, we have a paddock, we have a quite a big pen. So then we have smaller chicken pens inside that the chicks go in so that the other birds can come up and see them. We do that for a couple weeks and then we'll like open a door and they can go in and out um, just so that they, they can kind of acclimate to each other. Um, okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit about what, uh, what they eat. Um, because chickens pretty much eat every, everything. They're omnivores. So um, there are a few things that they probably shouldn't eat. Um, but they 100% they need clean water every day. So no, no matter what you're doing, you always wanna make sure that they have clean water. Um, and then um, we do pelleted food. So uh, we buy, well, for our layers, we buy like these big bags of organic non-GMO um, layer pelleted. Uh, and that's like their base. And then you can add to that. So um, 
it, depending on where you're getting feed, I know I was talking to someone, they were saying they were, it was almost $40 a bag, which is crazy. Um, generally, it's like $20-ish a bag for a 50-pound bag. Um, but yeah, it depends on your location and, and what quality you're, you're doing as well. Um, for us, I should really know this number. I think we have approximately 25 birds. We have a lot of birds, but like, sorry, we have 25 chick, like layers. So we go through about a bag a week, um, ish. Um, but we, well, sorry, we, we have ducks and guineas and all that that eat it too. So that's probably not super accurate. So um, you wanna make sure you have enough feeders and waterers so that they, they can kind of all fit around it at the same time. So they're not like piling up on each other. Um, and they, our, ours free range, so in the winter we have to, we supplement a little bit more, but in the summer, literally, they just kind of go and eat whatever they can find. There's, they're always after bugs and grass and we, cow poo, like they, they go, they eat everything. Um, but so you can, you can just feed them their, like their layer mash, uh, but then t if you want to supplement even just the basics, like give them some oyster shell for calcium and grit. So I don't know if you guys know, like a chicken doesn't, it, it's not like they eat and it goes right into their stomach. They eat and then they have something attached to their, their. when we do our, our butchering class, that's really interesting. It's like stuck to their, their breast. So it's like this ball and it's their gizzard um, or their crop, sorry. And it, it's got like um, stones. They'll, they'll actually eat like little pebbles and stones, and that'll whatever they eat, that'll go in there and, and it'll like mash it up. It's like a crazy. The crop stores it, oh, and then it goes into the okay, sorry. The crop stores it and then it goes into the gizzard. That is my butcher right there. Um, so, anyways, that so it, it it's gonna actually mash it up. So they actually need that that grit. So um, g giving them something with that grit, the oyster shells will help too. But. Um, is really good. I'm just gonna look up here. So yeah, pretty much fruits and vegetables, they'll, they'll eat anything. Um, there's all kinds of fun treats. Protein, I know it seems really weird to feed them eggs, but you can actually fry up eggs. Just don't give them an egg, because if they, they're, they're dumb animals, but they are smart. If they see that as a food source, a hen's gonna go lay an egg, and the next one's gonna come along and eat it. Um, and then you no longer have great layers because they will eat every egg you have because um, they'll, they'll know where to find it. So um, you definitely want to either bust it open so they can't recognize it like the shell. Um, we often take our egg shells from our eggs and then um, I mash them down to a fine powder and feed it back to them for, for calcium. Um, but you want to make sure that's mashed really well so that they don't know it's eggshell. Um, and then mealworms are really great. You can actually start like a mealworm farm in your basement. That's a whole other training, so we're not gonna go into that. Um, there are some things you shouldn't feed them. Um, and you can see a lot of them there. Obviously like candy and sugar, that's not good. Cut grass, a lot of people are like, well, I th thought they ate grass. The, the issue with cut grass is that you'll throw in like a big pile of cut grass, right? And they'll, they'll, they'll get in and they'll kick things around. But if it starts to heat up and, and pack down and ferment and mold, um, that's not going to be good for them. So you just, if you're going to do it, like sprinkle it around in little bits, but don't put like a big pile in there, it, it, it won't go well. So um, yeah, there's, there's lots of things they can eat the most things they can eat. It, honestly, if you're not gonna eat it, don't probably feed it to your chickens is what it comes down to. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else really important. Onions, onions and garlic, don't do. So, or dried, anything dried. Like obviously they're gonna eat, they're used to eating pelleted food, right? So if you give them like dried beans and stuff like that, it's gonna get moisture and it's gonna start to expand. That's not good news because their stomachs aren't that big. So. Um, one of the things I love to do in the fall is I take all my garden waste, so I'll pull all my old plants out, and then I'll just huck it in to the pen there, and they'll pick everything they want off of it, and they'll pretty much eat everything. Um, but then you always have like little bugs and spiders and worms and the roots and everything. They will eat everything, so um, very little 
do I have to compost? Because they, they'll eat it all. So, um, oh, look at that. So those are different watering options. I, we have lots, I just don't want to take them all. And then different feed options. Oh, we'll, okay, we'll get to that afterwards because we're going to talk about laying hens first. So um, I feel like we're covering a lot of information. So I apologize if it's like, seem, seems like a lot. So there's a ton of different breeds of, of laying hens. So the one, it's in your notebook, the one with all, like how to choose your chicken. Um, those aren't even close to the amount of breeds that there are. Those are just like kind of the typical ones that you can order. Um, so you kind of want to figure out like what, what kind of layer are you looking for? Uh, again, back to the, the first question I had said, like do your research, um, see what you're wanting. Some layers are quite a bit hardier than other layers. Um, and some go broody, um, and broody is a term just um, that they're, they're going to sit on those eggs and want to incubate those eggs. Um, so some are definitely better than others. So if, if you're like, oh, I definitely want my chicken to hatch out eggs, make sure that you have a, a, a breed that's going to do that for you. So they st normally start producing eggs at about 18 to 22 weeks. Uh, a healthy hen, depending on the breed, will lay about 250 eggs a year. Some will do 200, some will do 300, um, and they kind of go through laying cycles. So they'll normally do like five to seven eggs and then take a day off and then uh, kind of go through those cycles. Um, the first eggs that they lay could be really weird. They're, they're like, can be tiny or super oblong or no yolk in them or wrinkly. Um, their body's just kind of like figuring out how to do this. So um, after, I don't know, probably you know, half dozen to a dozen eggs. They should be fairly normal. And then if you have a layer that's all of a sudden laying a weird egg, it generally means there's something deficient in their diet or you're dealing with pests or disease. So, and we'll kind of cover that. Uh, but you definitely wanna make sure they're getting enough, enough calcium and protein so that they have, their body has what it needs to create an egg. So uh, it normally takes about 24 to 26 hours for a chicken to create a full egg. Um, so if you want to be guaranteed a dozen eggs a day, uh, or not a day, a week, well, you can get, we, we get more than a dozen eggs a day. So if you want to be guaranteed a dozen eggs a week, uh, you should have like at least three hens. If you want two dozen, obviously like six, seven, eight. Um, they are going to lay better in the spring and summer. Uh, just they, they need sunlight. They need a lot of sunlight in order to lay. So they're gonna do a lot more there. And then come the winter, you're just gonna get le less eggs. Um, some chickens stop laying completely. Uh, a lot of hens go through uh, a molt in the fall where it might freak you out because you'll be like, oh my goodness, what's wrong with my chicken? Like they're growing bald or their feathers are falling out. It's just a molt. They're and generally they stop laying for that. Their body's just going through a transition. So they get rid of all their old feathers and then get some new feathers. Um, so if you are wanting eggs in the winter, you can supplement with a light source. You can just put like a light bulb, um, in your coop. It, it doesn't really hurt your hen, but it doesn't give her her natural cycle of slowing down. So, um, uh, chickens like us, you're born with a certain amount of eggs. And so she's only going to lay however many she's going to lay. So if you force her to lay more up front, she'll just stop earlier, which there, there's people on both camps that think definitely do light and others that say definitely don't do what works for you. So, um, but that, that's kind of how that works. If you're going to, you're going to get more eggs up front and, and then not as much. Um, and believe it or not, weather can really affect your, your egg production as well. Uh, if it's really, really cold, they're probably not gonna lay. And if it's, believe it or not, if it's really, really hot, they're definitely not gonna lay. Chickens don't actually, they, they deal better with cool than they do with heat. So you're more likely to lose a chicken on the hottest day of the year than the coldest day of the year. Uh, so you gotta make sure, uh, whatever setup you have, make sure they have somewhere for, with, with shade that they can go in and be protected. Um, and their level, their level of nutrition is definitely gonna make a difference. And then, um, a, a parasites and diseases. 
Uh, we, we are gonna cover some of that, but if there's something going on, you're, you'll know because they won't be laying and they might look funny too. So, um, and then, yeah, we talked about molt. So a lot of people have asked about roosters. How many of you love roosters? Oh, that's way less people than has chickens. Okay, so roosters are a love-hate thing. So um, I really like my, I actually have four roosters right now and they, it's manageable. They're all, they're all really good. But yeah, roosters can be known to be violent. And, and the whole point is, is they're protecting their ladies, right? They're there to protect them. Um, you wanna be really careful uh, that you don't have a super aggressive rooster. If you do, I suggest eat them, put them in the freezer and get a new one. Because once they're aggressive, it does, that doesn't really go away which kind of sucks. Um, Cause I know we've had really pretty roosters that I was really excited to keep. And then I was like, well, soup. soup. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're w w the older birds, you, you generally just soup them. So you don't need a rooster. Like your, your chickens are gonna lay with or without a rooster. You just can't, f they, they won't be fertile. So you can't hatch out eggs that don't have a rooster. Um, so it's not something that's needed. I know some towns have, um, bylaws where you can have chickens but you can't have roosters um, which is super handy and then you just have to find fertilized eggs somewhere else um, so that it's not a, it's not a really big deal um, it, a rooster does help with your pecking order though um, in my personal opinion I know some people have found it different but I find when I have a good rooster um, my hens I don't have as much fighting with my hens. If you don't have a rooster, there's still gonna be a pecking order and your hens are gonna figure it out. Um, and you'll know who the bully is. She'll, others will run away. Uh, but I, I find a rooster really helps with that. But then on the flip side, if you have too many roosters, um, they can fight, but it hurts your hens because you'll have more roosters breeding your hens. And you'll know you have issues because your, your hens are gonna start missing feathers at the back of their neck and on their back. Um, because the roosters are pulling them out. So, and then you just need to get rid of some roosters because um, that's not nice to your ladies. So, all right. So we're gonna talk really quick about dual purpose breeds. I'm gonna talk about meat birds, but before that, um, dual purpose breeds, um, in the, the handout that you have, it's gonna give you the different kind of breeds. A lot of those ones can be dual purpose, which means they're really good egg layers, but their body mass is actually big enough to make it worth raising them as a meat birds. So when you raise a meat bird, you wanna have, like you wanna make sure that the effort you're putting in is you're gonna get enough back out too, right? Um, so yeah, they're, they're kind of a combination they're, they're going to grow larger and faster than some of the other ones. And typic, like the typical popular varieties are like the Plymouth Rock, Jersey Giants, Rhode Island Red, and Wyandots, and then the Sussex. So, and I know Donna's going to kind of cover some of our heritage breeds. So um, I'll, I'll kind of let her talk about that. And, and so th that's what a dual purpose is. It, it doesn't, like any bird you can use for meat really, and any bird you can use for eggs. But these ones just are like the best of the best. They're big enough and they lay lots of eggs. So, so we're, meat birds are the, the, uh, the cross. So they grow really big, really fast. And there, it, there's conflicting things on meat birds um, because essentially like you're only gonna grow them for eight weeks. They, you, you're not gonna try and breed these birds um, you don't even want them alive after 10 weeks. Um, just the way they're bred, they are bred to grow really fast, really big, but there is downsides to that. So the, the, the upside is that you have a lot of meat quickly and it's normally, it's tender meat pretty much because they don't move a whole lot. So some people think it's kind of cruel. Um, if you raise them right, it's not cruel at all. Like I, I re I'm really happy with how we raise our meat birds. I know lots of people do it differently. Um, so they, they typically weigh four to five pounds in like six to eight weeks, which is a, like, I know you don't really think about like how big four to five pounds is, but that, that's good size. <laughs> it's an adult bird in a really short time. So you're gonna start, you're gonna take your meat birds home in a box like this. They're gonna go into it, something like this. And within three days, probably less, you need to have something double this size. So they, they will double their size every few days. 
So you need to have a good sized brooder, but they can't go outside until about four or to six weeks. Um, we always order ours a little bit later in the season so that it's nice outside so that I can put them outside at six weeks because they stink. <laughs> They, they eat a lot, so they poop a lot. So I try and get them outside as, as easy as possible. Um, so you're gonna generally order them at a feed store. Um, I have bought them off Kijiji. Um, there's different ways that you can get them, but generally people order these kind at, at a feed store. It's not, a, it's not an, a breed like you're gonna keep a pair to breed later. They'll die if you do that, so don't do that. Um, so when you get them, you're gonna take them out of the box. They, I don't really know why, but they have almost no chicken instincts, which sounds horrible. So you're gonna take, what I do is I take a chick out of the box, I hold it, I dip its beak in water. I put it down, I grab the next one, I dip its beak in water. I'm not even kidding you, I do it for every single bird I pull out, um, because otherwise they won't find the water. They're that, they're that smart. Same with the food, like you wanna make sure, um, you're, you wanna make sure they can find the food easily. A lot of times you gotta bring them over to it. Um, so they're not gonna do like your normal eating and drinking. They, they will, but you kind of have to encourage that a little bit. Um, and they're not gonna do things like dust bath to see, or, or grooming to keep themselves clean. Um, and they don't have the social skills or the awareness of danger. So you need to have whatever structure you normally have, make sure it's good and protected. So a really great way around this is if you have a good broody hen from your flock, you can actually put her in Make sure she's nice to them. Um, but you can sometimes, if you know you have a good motherly hen, you've, she's hatched chicks out before, she knows the drill, you can actually put her in with your meat birds. And she'll show them how to eat and how to clean themselves. And you'll just have a little bit smarter of a breed. Um, and it just helps them out a little bit. And then you're only gonna wanna feed them, ha let them have access to food for like 12 hours and then take it away. Um, because they will just keep eating. Like that's how they're bred. They will literally eat and eat and eat. But if you don't take the food away, um, they, they'll just keep eating and they'll actually grow so big that their body can't sustain it, which sounds horrible. So you just wanna make sure that, that you're gonna give them that time to like digest and move around a little bit. Um, we like to put them, on, once we move them out of the brooder, we, like, we have an actual old carport. I wonder if there's something similar to something like that that we have covered. Um, that we put them out in and then we just move it every day. So they have access to fresh grass. Having a broody hen in there helps a lot because they don't actually know to peck at the grass. Um, they'll literally sit, or I have one of the big feeders, they'll sit around the feeder and kill the grass. Like it's, they're not super bright. So you wanna move it every day, otherwise they're gonna die. Uh, and you're gonna wanna make sure that whatever shelter it is, it is safe from predators because they're, otherwise they're kind of like sitting ducks and it, it has good shelter. So a place, you know, if it starts raining really hard or it's really windy that they can go and protect themselves because otherwise they'll just sit where they are. They're not super bright. Um, so generally you're gonna butcher them at like between six and 10 weeks. 10 is really pushing it because they grow so fast. Um, if you can get them on pasture moving around a bit, their, their structure can hold it a little bit better. It sounds crazy when I say that out loud. Um, but if they grow too big, um, you start having issues with heart attacks, water around, you'll, when you go to butcher, there'll be like a water sack around their heart. Um, their, their legs will start to splay because they can't support themselves. So you, you butcher them a little bit sooner. Um, if you plan on selling your meat, you do have to take it to a government inspected place. Um, I don't know a lot of different ones. We use Chicken Little in Elmer. Um, generally, we're growing our meat birds for ourselves, so we just butcher them ourselves. And this summer, we will do a butcher workshop. Um, if you're interested, I know some people are a little squeamish. It's a really cool process. Um, so then we just kind of plan. Sometimes we'll, we'll take two weekends and the first weekend we'll do half our birds that are bigger and the next weekend we'll do the other ones too. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of how meat birds work. Um, but you would never be able to keep, they're a cross between two birds. So you'd never be able to take those birds and raise them up then breed them out. They just wouldn't, 
live that long. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> I feel like there's gonna be a lot of questions about that afterwards and that's okay. Um, so pests and disease. I already kind of talked about like being cautious when you're, when you're taking birds from other farms, making sure you're good. So there, there are a good bit of, of pests and disease for chickens. Um, hopefully you don't run into a lot of them. I'm just gonna cover a couple quick ones. Uh, avian influenza, I know you guys have all heard about the avian flu. Um, it's a respiratory uh, disease and it's, it's passed through wild birds. So like unless, that's why a lot of chicken farmers, their barns have no windows. Ver they have very different ventilation. It's ventilation going out, not ventilation going in. Um, well, obviously it's going in, but it's, it's um, filtered. Um, so you're gonna, like if you have chickens that are having trouble walking, diarrhea, lack of appetite, um, lack of, or discolor in their comb, like their comb is a, the red thing on their head if it starts looking really pale. Um, it's not super common. I know we've heard lots about it. There hasn't been a lot of, a, a lot of cases. So um, coccidiosis is another one. It's a parasite that chickens can get. That's probably the most common thing is coccidiosis. Um, you're gonna notice like really runny poop, bloody uh, weight loss. Uh, and possible death. They'll have, again, the, their, their combs, if they go pale, that could be part of it. Um, so it, it thrives in like warm, moist areas. So if you're cleaning your chicken coop out really well, um, hopefully you won't have to deal with this. Just make sure it's, it's tidy. Like when you build your coop, we'll talk about this. Uh, you wanna keep it away from like um, mud and water. I, I know this time of year, like good luck keeping anything away from mud, but uh, the, the coop itself, you want to keep it clean uh, with lots of straw down. Um, and, the, and cleaning your feeders and waters, making sure that that's all clean, and then you shouldn't have too much trouble. And then another one I just want to talk about was like chicken mites uh, or blood, blood sucking mites. I know that sounds lovely. Um, so they generally feed on poultry during the night. So if you're, if again, if their comb is looking dull and they're, they're looking really lethargic, you can check their, their vent, which is essentially their bum, uh, check their vent feathers and see if you can f see any mites. A lot of times it, it feeds on their legs too. So you'll see their legs, um, and around their comb and stuff under their wings. Um, so they, they normally hide during the day and they're tiny, tiny, like it's really hard to see it. Um, and there's all kinds of different things you can treat. Like a lot of this stuff, you can go to the feed store and, and get medication to treat this stuff. There's a lot of natural remedies out there. So uh, I know we use diatomaceous earth, um, which kill, doesn't hurt the chickens, but kills all the parasites. Uh, so, but there's, there is a lot of natural things you can do as opposed to medicating your birds. Oh my goodness, I'm like halfway through. Sorry, I don't even know how long I've been talking. Okay, so building your coop, that's what this was for. Um, you can, you can kind of make the decision ahead of time, do a little bit of research to see what space you have and what you want. Building your coop, it, you can actually like DIY it or you can just go like PV Mart or I'm sure there's lots of other places that you can buy like a ready-made coop. Um, there's just a kind of couple things that you, uh, kind of want to make sure you have. One of the things that you want to note, like are you raising layers for year round? Because that's going to be a different coop than like um, something open like the um, carport one for, for meat birds, right? That's not going to offer a lot of protection in the winter time. So these are just kind of, I just took a whole bunch of slides and just threw some different ideas. Some are more elaborate, like this guy, um, the, the little A-frame there, super duper easy to do. A lot of people have scraps of wood and stuff that they can put in, um, and then you just let them kind of free range or have them fenced in. Um, this is a really simple A-frame one that you can do, so half of it's covered, half of it's open, and then you can move that every day so your, so your chickens can get around. Um, I, I love the portable ones, I think they're so much fun. Um, if you are in town and, and you can't do that, that's completely okay. Uh, but this is nice for moving it. Um, I, I think this one's really fun. Again, this is for like pasture, right? And then you can see in the background, th this is chicken um, poultry fencing. Um, and it's an electric fence that a lot of times it's done with solar, but then you just turn it off and then you can move it and it's got little spikes that you just spike it into the ground. So you can move your fencing around every day if you want. 
which is really handy. And you can see, this has a pointer thingy? I don't know, maybe not. Anyways, um, you can see that they have a water system set up there, and then their feed is inside, and then they have to go up. It's, it's up off the ground, so you don't have to worry as much about predators there. And this is another really great one, just being able to move it every day. Um, you want to have it lightweight enough that you can move it or on wheels, um, and then protected for predators. Um, so I'm going to just touch on a couple things that you need. So the location of your coop is kind of important. Like if you're building something to stay, you want to make sure you've thought about a lot of these things. If you're if you're building something that you can move around, some of it's a little bit less important. Um, so you wanna make sure uh, that you've picked a good, a good spot and you wanna build it high enough so that if there is a lot of rain or flooding or anything that it's not gonna get wet. Um, it's recommended to actually build it up off the ground, like 12 or 18 inches. I think I have, oh, I love that one. Sorry, I put a lot of photos in here. I didn't really remember what ones I had. Okay, so this is our layer coop. So it's looking a little worse for wear. We had our calves in it this summer, or not in there, in, in that paddock, and they love to shove their head through. So we had to put a board on the inside. Anyways, they wrecked the door and we just haven't really fixed it. So we have ours up against our shop and it doesn't really look like it, but it is quite up off the ground. The chickens have gone underneath and have like kicked everything out. So there's a low spot underneath that it's really great for um, shade. It, we, our, our main predators are like hawks and stuff so they can run under there and be safe. Um, but it, it is up off the ground. So you're not gonna have stuff like mice and rats, snakes, stuff like that. Like you could technically have something under there, but I don't know if you've ever seen a video of a chicken and a mouse. Has anyone ever seen that? <laughs> if we ever catch a rodent, it goes in our chicken pen and our chickens are so excited. They, they eat every bit of it. They eat every single bit of it. They have a lot of fun chasing it. Um, that sounds really gruesome, but hey, it is what it is. So, um, so you want to make sure that, like, we have it kind of up against our shop, so that's going to block the wind. Um, every once in a while, we have a wind that comes the other way, but it, there's, it's pretty protected. There is actually, I should have taken side, there's, like, big three-by-three three windows, so there's lots of light in there. Um, and then, so it's off the ground, out of the wind, and then we have it so that there's almost all day there's, there's sun. So they have lots of sunlight. They ha that most of them, like they're, we have a big paddock that this is in, but, and they're, so they're like free range and then they can actually get into all the paddocks because they, they just fly over. We're not as worried about, we have enough room. So uh, yeah, but you wanna make sure they get enough sun to do, um, to, to lay. And then for the size of the coop, you want three to four feet per bird. Um, and then when it comes to uh, your run, so like if you, if you can't have your birds free range, free range then you wanna have um, like, I'm trying to think if I have a number here for it. Uh, yeah, eight to 10 feet if they don't have any outdoor, right? So we weren't really super worried about it on the inside. Um, so they have their nest boxes. It's a bit of a mess because it's been all winter. Um, they have their food hanging, and then it's hard to see, but they all on the side here, we have all different boards going across uh, where you can see the one chicken butt there. Um, they, they, can na they can roost, so we have them kind of all over the place so that there's lots of roosting room for them. Um, and then they do kind of, I don't advise that, but there's a roost in front of the nesting boxes too. So you want to make sure that there's enough place for them to roost, and then if they don't have access to outside, you have to have a bigger coop. Otherwise, you're going to start getting um, a lot of like fighting and sickness and disease going through. Um, it's always a good idea to have lots of, lots of space. All right. Um, yeah, and if you, you want to make sure you're cleaning, especially a smaller space, you want to be cleaning that out because um, as they're going to poop, right? Wherever they roost, they're going to poop. Yeah, um, we do a deep, uh, a deep litter method in the winter to help them stay insulated. So generally, we'll clean it out once 
sometimes twice during the winter, but then we put straw down, we let them poop, and I put more straw down, and then so every week we're putting, so you start getting a really thick layer, and then in the spring we use that in the garden, but it actually kind of works as an insulation. I do not recommend that in the summer at all. Just clean it out in the summer because of the warmth, you're gonna get like parasites and you're gonna have issues. But in the winter, it's so cold that that actually helps keep them warm. So uh, we built our coop with wood. You can honestly use whatever you have. Um, so our floor, we have a wood floor and then we, I just put a call out on Facebook and asked if anyone had any um, like, not aluminum, vinyl. What's that flooring called? Linoleum, there we go. I, I was getting there. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I just rolled out some linoleum on there so that like you can scrape it all out and clean it all out because if you just leave it on the, on the wood, it, it will rot your wood. So, um, and uh, you can get, start getting bugs and stuff in the wood. So just have kind of a protector barrier there. Um, so predator protection, uh, elevating the coop helps a lot. Um, you can, make sure that they can't get in, but in, like you need to make sure your vent, or it, your, your coop is well ventilated. So it's not gonna be airtight. So, and honestly, if a mouse, a rat, or a raccoon can fit its head in, it can get in. So um, believe it or not, I don't have a door over my little door. That's open all year, all the time. You can, we actually have one of the opening and closing doors. We have had bad experiences in the past of something being able to get in and nobody being able to get out. So this is a personal choice. If, if you are in town or you want it a little bit more secure, you can make it as secure as you want. I have had no issue with this setup at all. Um, it does help that I have some bigger birds. I have some ducks and turkeys and stuff like that. Um, but if something were to come into my chicken's pen, they can all get out. Um, and then they'll just go, we have trees that line our, our thing, they'll just go up into the trees. Um, but generally, you want to have a little bit of predator protection. You want to make sure you have a shaded or covered area that they can run into, whether it be bushes or just like a board or something, so that if you have um, hawks or anything flying overhead, they can get underneath, because um, that's a really, they're sitting ducks for that. They'll, they'll just come swoop and grab it and leave. Um, we have Muscovy ducks. Um, we, a couple years ago, we were losing a bird every night to an owl and every day to a hawk. They, and they knew where to find them, so they just kept coming back. So then we ended up with geese. They were really loud. So then we, we figured out that Muscovies are kind of our way to go and we have literally not lost, we didn't lose a single bird last year, did we? Nope, nothing at all. And we have a nesting hawk, like, with, with little hawks. So we still see the owl, we know they're still there, but they're not taking our birds anymore. So um, kind of working, figuring that kind of stuff out is kind of nice. I know Donna has Muscovies too, and I really love them. They're a really fun bird. Um, you wanna make sure you have secure lo latches. If you are locking everything up, just so you know, a raccoon can open that. 100%. Pretty near any, any latch you have, a raccoon can get it, except for those spring-loaded ones. So you know the hook, and then you have to like pull back the spring to lift the hook up. They can't get those ones. So um, like, and the, like opossums and skunks and stuff like that. All those lovely animals, you just wanna make sure that they, they stay out. Um, we do have dogs. They obviously don't go in the pen, but they go around, so their smell kind of helps deter some, some animals. You don't have to have a dog, by the way. If you have a friend with a dog, just ask if you can have a bag of the dog hair after they brush it. They might think you're crazy, that's okay. Um, we put dog hair all over the place. Uh, we put it in our garden. I actually pick up my dog poop, because they poop on my lawn, and I put it along the perimeter of my property. Um, that sounds really gross, but it works, so. Um, yeah, a secure door, obviously. Practice what you preach, I'm not doing that. Um, and then nesting boxes. You wanna have at least one nesting box for every three birds. My, my husband sent me a photo this morning. If I had had it yesterday, I would've put it in the screen or in the presentation. Our Muscovy duck, for some reason, has decided to use a nesting box, which is not common for them. Anyways, so she's, he sent me a photo of our, our broody, little tiny white hen with a duck on top of it. So <laughs> make sure you have enough and then you, you wanna put, you wanna make sure there's straw in there because everyone's gonna have a favorite. 
nesting box and they want the one with lots of straw. So um, you generally want them like one foot by one foot. If you have a bigger bird, like a Jersey giant or something, a little bit bigger is nicer or apparently a Muscovy duck. They were definitely not built for that. Um, but you wanna make sure that they're, they're clean. Sometimes they'll go in there and poop. You wanna clean it out. Otherwise you get really gross eggs. Um, and you wanna make sure you collect your eggs every day because like we get, like right now we're, we're getting about a dozen a day and there's six boxes and there's three preferred nesting boxes. So if I don't get eggs today, tomorrow I'm gonna get eggs covered in yolk because they're gonna keep laying on top of eggs and then they're gonna sit on it and it's gonna squish it. So don't, don't make sure, if you're gonna go through all the effort to get nice eggs, make sure you go collect them every day. So, and you can do straw or sawdust. You can actually buy these like pads. I don't really know what they're called, but they kind of feel like straw and then put them in because the, the hens are gonna hop in there and the first thing they're gonna do is they're gonna go around and they're gonna kick, right? And straws, and they're gonna like fluff down, get really comfortable and they're gonna kick all the straw out. So you, you do have to keep adding it in. Um, uh, and it's a good idea to have like a bucket or an area with um, sand so that they can go in and dust and keep, keep themselves clean. Uh, I have this kind of under nesting boxes, but um, you can get like a little kiddie pool or uh, I've seen people do it with like an old tire and then just put a, a, a bag of Play-Doh, Play-Doh, no. Play sand, there we go. Play sand in there so they can go in and dust and that's gonna really help cut down on diseases, dirt um, and mites. And then if you do, you find have mites, then you can put a scoop of diatomaceous earth in that and kind of mix it in and that'll naturally kind of cl clear that up. So um, also for the coop, you have to decide whether or not you want electricity. So we actually do have electricity because if you see in the bottom corner here, we have a waterer there um, that they sit on and poop on, so you have to take it out every day and clean it. Um, but in the winter, we have a little electrical box that we have a light bulb in, um, and that kind of just, or you can get like a little heater pad so that your water doesn't freeze in the winter, so you don't have to go change it three times a day. Um, so we have electricity in there so that we can have a warmer on our water, and then we run another um, de-icer in the, the other animal's water. Um, so it's not necessary if you're going to have a light, again, electricity is nice. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend you do not put a heat light in there. Um, so many bad things for that is, uh, one fire hazard big time, um, because they do fly around and, and bonk around a, l a little bit. Um, but also you really do want your chickens. They will just naturally acclimate to whatever the temperature is, right? So. As the summer comes in, they'll get used to the heat. They'll go into the shade when they need it. In the winter, when it gets really cold, this is what my chickens are in when it was like, what, minus 27 or something? The, there's like, stuff can get in, the, the door is open. They were completely fine. They, they keep each other warm in the coop. But if you have a heat lamp in there and you have a really bad ice storm and your heat light goes out, your chickens will probably die because they haven't acclimated to that temperature. They will literally freeze to death. So um, I really recommend not having a heater. Again, personal preference. Some people feel bad for the birds and want them to be warm. They're 100% fine, I promise you. It's like minus 25 and my birds are outside walking around, kicking snow, they're fine. Uh, if they're cold, they'll go inside. Uh, again, roosting bars that we have, you, you have to have those. They need somewhere to roost, otherwise you're gonna, they're, they're not gonna be healthy. Um, don't do metal and don't do like round because uh, they have a hard time gripping to round and metal in the winter is really cold and their feet can freeze to it. So we have found like just, um, I think those are like one by ones, like a two by four cut in half, whatever scrap wood you have, quite honestly, they'll be fine. Um, you can even get like tree branches. I know they're rounder, but they're not so tiny. So you just need them to be able to keep their foot open a little bit. Uh, but roosting bars are really, really uh, important. And a good idea is to not put them on top of each other. Because, can you guys see where this is going to go? Yeah, the top birds are just going to poop on the bottom birds. So we have them, we actually, you can see the one, and then behind that there's another one, and then we have some 
cornered and they're, they're kind of all over the place. So, and then in our actual coop, what we do is when we trim our trees in the spring, we actually throw some of the branches in uh, so they can roost on those outside during the day. Um, and then my goats come and scratch themselves on them. So um, everyone's happy. Uh, and then coop ventilation, super, super important. You wanna make sure it's not um, airtight. It, it needs to breathe. So the top, oh, I should have taken the picture of that. The top of our coop is actually quite open so air can get in and out. So do sparrows, by the way. We have nesting sparrows in there always. Um, so, but you need to have it ventilate because uh, especially in the winter when they're in there quite a bit, you get that really awful ammonia smell. Um, you, you just need really good, good ventilation. Um, you can, if you're in town, if you're like worried about predators, have your open ventilation and then just put hardware cloth, like, like it's like mesh but metal, um, so that stuff can't get in. Uh, so that could help a little bit too. And chicken wire is meant to like close off an area, but a chicken wire is not going to protect your chickens for anything. Like a, a raccoon's just going to go right through that, just so you know. You want hardware cloth for that instead. Uh, and then, cleaning your coop. Like if you're going to go through all the effort of having the birds, make sure you clean their coop. Um, I, f I know I had it somewhere. Oh yeah, one bird will accumulate one foot of manure every six months. So like, that's a lot. One cubic foot of poop. So Luckily for you, it's really good for your gardens. So, but you're gonna wanna clean out the coop. Um, I definitely clean mine more in the summer and because I do the deep litter in the winter. Um, but you're gonna have so much less problems. You're not gonna have respiratory issues. You're not gonna have as many pests or parasites. So definitely clean it. Um, you can, like vinegar and water. Like if you clean it all out and you just wanna spray it down with a little vinegar and water, don't use bleach. Bleach is a horrible idea. Um, you can give it a scrub or you can just kind of spray it down. There's, a, there's all kinds of different things. There's like a, a garden lime you can, can use as well if you have any parasite issues, that'll help clean it up. Um, just making sure I have everything. I, th I think that's pretty much for the coop. Okay, and then, we, like I said, we are gonna do a butchering workshop this summer. Um, I just have to get birds first. So six weeks, eight weeks after I get birds, I'll do that. So a couple resources that are really, really good. Okay, hold on. Um, a couple resources that are really good. If you're looking for somebody um, to watch on, on YouTube or to read, Joel Salton is fantastic. He has Polyface Farms in the States, and he does a whole regenerative farming method. Really, really good. He has great information for caring for your flock. Um, he's got a ton of books, and then he has a blog, it's called The Lunatic Farmer. Um, like one of his books is called Everything I Wanna Do is Illegal. <laughs> he, he's a very easy read, it's, it's lovely information, very like-minded, like him a lot. Um, also Harvey Ussery, this, is, this information's in your package, by the way, you don't have to write it down. Uh, Harvey Ussery, he has a small scale poultry flock and all natural approach to raising chickens and other fowl for home and garden market, garden growers. That's the book name. It's in your, you don't have to write it down. That's a really long one. And then he has a website called The Modern Homestead. So there's lots of stuff that you can do. Both of them are on YouTube so you can watch, watch their stuff, you can read their stuff. But just, those are people like, I feel really confident that I can say like, they have really good information, they're not wackadoodles. Um, again, so we have the, if you're interested in chick days, I, I got a whole bunch of these, so you guys can take, if, whether you're at Elgin Feeds or Oxford Feed, and then I do have, I know a lot of people have asked me about alternative feeds, um, because you're gonna get kind of the standard feeds there, so there's a gentleman, I have his business cards up here if you want him, Wholesome Feeds, he actually grows and bags his own. He does organic non-GMO, um, and this is who I personally use. Um, he, we've been really, really happy with him. He's very, very like-minded. Um, there's no junk, so then he's got like all this, the, the starter layer grower, all that, but the, and then I get my goat food and my rabbit food and all that just for him too. So if you're looking for an alternative, um, his, his information is here as well. Uh, and then the feed stores, like where you order your chicks, 
they're, they're gonna have everything. So they're gonna have brooders, they're gonna have all your, whatever these are, feeder waters, like all, all the stuff that you need. If you're starting from scratch, that's a really great way to go and just get the basics. You don't need anything crazy. I know you feel like you wanna have it all, but uh, yeah, I think that is all I needed to cover. So does anybody have any questions? <laughs> feel like everyone's like, I just don't, can't even take any more information in. So, um, can you hear me okay? Uh, the whole homesteading and prepping, it's time consuming. Yes. All the aspects, right? Yeah. Um, so with, uh, so say if we were to start with just uh, four laying hens mm -hmm. as a very basic, a small little spot. Yep. What is uh, the daily time commitment uh, to maintaining them? That's my first question. And second, um, can we do the same with four laying ducks with a little kitty pool because they seem so cute <laughs> can you do the same yeah so time uh we we probably like four birds i don't know 10 or 15 minutes in like t daily like if you're like for us we have quite a bit more so we have a half hour in the morning 15 at noon half hour at night but the, i'm feeding cows and goats and the whole gamut right um so if you just have the two layers like half an hour a day like it's not a lot and it, probably not even that but I'm thinking like for the days you have to clean it and you're, you're changing water and food making sure they're happy collecting your eggs so and if it's like if it's just in your backyard you're not even having to go walk very far to do that I would do morning and evening like we let our birds come in and out we feed them in the morning and at night and then I actually we lock up the goats because they're like itty bitty and just protecting them, so, but everybody else, like the turkeys and the ducks, they all stay out all the time. When there's an ice storm, I take them in, I force them in, but they don't wanna be in, so. You can have four laying ducks, it's honestly, it's gonna be more time, because they are messy. Like, you think you're gonna give them a nice little pool and they're gonna play in the water, they're not. They're gonna go find every little bit of dirt that they can and they're gonna put it in their mouth and then they're gonna put it in the pool and mix it up into mud and then they're gonna take all the water and mud and spray it all out of the pool. Muscovies are not that bad, I'm just gonna say. Of all the ducks we've ever had, Muscovies are the least messy. Do you need to come up to the mic? Oh. Oh, ducks, yeah, du ducks do not lay year round. Like our ducks just started laying about last month. Um, what month is it, March? No, they probably started laying just at the beginning of this month. They don't lay in the winter. I'm just gonna throw in there. Khaki Campbells and Harlequins are like a laying hen. They will lay 200 eggs a year. Perfect. So you do have laying ducks, but they're messy. Yes. Really messy. Yeah, and we, we've we had um, other ducks that, that laid better, but then our, my, my Muscovies are for protection for my, my flock and then we benefit from their eggs as well, so. I'm just wondering if you have three or four laying hens, what would the financial commitment be per month after you have like the coop and everything set up? Feed wise, probably 20 bucks. I, yeah, we have like, uh, I know people have asked me, I don't actually know the answer to how many birds I have. So I'd like say, I, I probably have about 25 and I go through a bag of feed a week in the winter. Yeah, uh, we hardly go through any feed in the summer because they just eat everything else. Twenty dollars a month, maybe. Like it's not a it's not a huge output, right? So my idea always is is I sell enough eggs to cover my feed, and all the rest is mine. So then then I can eat the rest of the eggs. So perfect. I just have a couple of questions for like we have raccoons always killing our chickens and no matter what we do we cannot get them to stop so now they're like locked inside a little space because we yeah can't figure out how else to keep do they bother you during the day or do, during the day too or just yeah, all the time that's crazy and, oh okay okay and another one like do you mix your meat birds and your layers together i personally don't but you can because we tried it and it didn't it wasn't great. Meat birds are not the yes, same as not. like okay. other other birds. They just do not, okay. they're just not chickeny. I don't know how else to say it. Like they're just, <laughs> I know, I know they're chickens, but they're like, just, they're just not chickeny, right? So having some chickens with your meat birds definitely helps them to survive and thrive better. 
Um, and I know that you can. The problem comes in is that to go through all the effort to integrate them into your flock, um, and they're just, oh my gosh, I feel so mean. They're dumb. Yes, they're life support systems for a stomach. Yeah, honestly, they're a life support system for a stomach to, to help grow them. But then the other chickens are, are going to peck them like pest them yeah. so it's just yeah. easier to keep them yeah and then your muscovy ducks like we have like an outdoor pond so would you just leave them there all the time or would you bring them in i'm just worried that raccoons will kill them too i'll deal with that okay you'll too. yeah i i haven't had any issues with, with raccoons like muscovies they are they are awesome and like the they'll if you have the water they'll be on the water at night so you shouldn't have any trouble with that but like we live in the middle of the country we have we have raccoons, we take care of raccoons, um, but they, yeah, Don is gonna cover a lot of that, but the Muscovies, honestly, they are the least work of any bird I've ever had. They, they are, they, they're outside all year. They don't, even, they don't, well, clearly right now they're using my nest boxes, but they, they just roost on whatever's out there and they're just happy to be outside. <laughs> Yeah, have you ever had it where your chickens totally lose all their feathers on their butt and their butt is bare? Yeah. Yeah? Like, what causes that? They just have a weird molt. Yeah, so... Like, it is really gross. Yeah, so they can molt. They can... It, I said, it, it freaks you out, right? It does. When they molt, it freaks you out. The other thing is making sure you don't have too many roosters or that she's well, not getting is, pecked. Like, I'm starting to wonder, like, I didn't think we had any roosters. You'll know if you have but a rooster. But now they're pecking. Oh, that's really just, pecking. yeah, so it, if they're pick, picking at her, they're picking at her one, they're probably a little bit bored. Actually, there's about six or seven of them that have, like, a lot of their feathers out of their back right that's now. Mites. Yeah, mite, that would be my thought, mites. Um, you want to make sure you don't have mites. Cause like, I, because they, the pen gets cleaned out, like, probably every 10 days or something. It doesn't something. matter. If there's mites, they're, okay. they're in there. So then, you, yeah, you need to treat okay. that. Um, well, I've seen them where they're pecking. So would they be pecking at the mites? Yeah, so okay. th the other thing is that they're pecking, like sometimes you, d you actually do have to separate a bird because they're, they're not necessarily mean, but they are, they're horrible. Like if, if there's a chicken that has a cut or an injury, you really need to separate it for her sake because they're, every single chicken in there is gonna come pick at it. And they will eat that bird. Yeah, the, the, yeah. They'll, f they'll fully it's like, carnivores. it's gross. Yeah, okay. So I know we had a, <laughs> Jaden was moving, um, uh, a, I can't even think, a pen with the chicks in it, right? So he was, yeah, he was lifting it up and moving it, and one kind of ran underneath it, and it got under it, and he thought it was fine, and it kind of was for a little bit, and then it died. So it was running around, and it died, and we were like, what in the world is going on over there? Everyone's like pecking at something, and we were like, oh, a bird died, and they're gonna, yeah. they were eating it. Oh, yeah, it was, <laughs> the turkeys found it first, so. Yeah, just relative to the, uh, the loss of feathers on the butt and, and the pecking, we, we had that problem and we tried coating their butts so that they wouldn't like the taste. And ultimately we found on the web that a good solution is to get um, eye goggles for them. That's what we're doing. That, that clip Sorry. on on their beaks. Eye goggles? So that they can't look straight forward, they can only see sideways and they won't then be able to. I don't even know where to go with this comment. <laughs> So th they work great because okay. ours are recovering now. Okay, <coughs> perfect. Yeah, okay. Blinders. blinders, eye blinders. Blinders. Okay, yeah. that's really interesting. When you can put little. You can stick on little googly eyes on. That on just these makes blinders. me think of that like bib <laughs> with the trousers. So when they run, it's like. Anyways, <laughs> you can Google like funny chicken things, you guys. Hours of entertainment. So, but that's that's interesting. I had not heard of that. So. Yeah, you just need a special pair of pliers to be able to ply them, uh, some narrow tipped ones that are usually used for uh, retaining clips on, okay. on, uh, on uh, C clips. Interesting. So it works very well. Cool. All right, so gog blinder goggles for chickens if they're yeah. pecking at each other. But yeah. um, So I'm wondering, when you've got chicks, and, and we have a round corral that we expand and collapse yes. as they get older and bigger, and we kind of tent over top of it with an old sheet yep. and we have a hanging heat lamp uh, on a dimmer so that we can easily control the temperature but I noticed yours in your pictures you had it wide open you didn't have it covered to maintain an ambient consistent um, in the spring when we had our hens we found that the the pen temperature 
inside the house would really go up and down. You know, and we were afraid that the, uh, the chicks would get um, uh, um, shocked by the temperature change of the ambient in the, in the room. Is that a problem or are we over concerned that we put like are a your, tent over it? To control so are they, the is this outside or inside? Inside, inside a coop, um, you know, day old chicks. As long as they have a, an area of warmth, so, so whether you have a brooder or a heat light that yeah, they can go light. under and go under. They, and Jada had, had talked about that too, is you wanna make sure it's a high enough, high enough so that like, you can comfortably put your arm under there and it, it, you're not yeah. like feeling like it's hot or cold because if they're, they're gonna move away as they need to, Meat, again, guys, sorry, meat birds, I'm, I'm just picking on them. They're less likely to move. They're more likely to die. Oh, but like yeah. uh, layer chicks, they'll, they're, they'll move when, when it's too hot or too cold, right? You just don't want it to get, if, it's, if there's nowhere they can go away from the heat, they'll, they'll pile on each other and die. And if you don't have enough heat, they'll pile on each other and die. Yeah. Right? They'll try, they'll try and like, they'll, except they'll pile in under where the heat is, but then they'll pack in because they're cold. So you, you want to make sure it's like, if it's comfortable for you, it's comfortable for them. Well, we find we need to tent over the thing to keep the temperature consistent. And I put a temperature controller in it and, and a, 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 a you know, 750 watt little heater and it cycles. Okay. And, I, uh, I've, often I do it in my garage. It's an unheated garage. It's about the temperature of a, a refrigerator. Right. And then I have my brooder in there with a heat, with a heat source. And that's enough. Mm. Okay. So it, if you're feeling like it's too cold, you can do something to warm them up, but they're, they're hardy enough. The big thing, the, the temperature they can deal with a lot more than they can deal with uh, a breeze. If, they, if there's a cold breeze coming through, no, they won't survive that. Mm. So anybody else have any questions? Oh, we're doing good. J just another thought with the, uh, the heat lamps. I know you're really against them, but I put mine on a dimmer. Makes a vast difference. They never burn out. You can control in the winter how much heat you want. We hang it over the water on a chain so you can vary the height even. And yep. you just set it down really low. It just creates enough heat so the water never freezes. Works well. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you can put it on a dimmer, that's nice. Yeah, they're cheap, the dimmers, so. Yeah. My fear is always fire. So that's, well, I, I if just If you switched. run them full out, they, they will get really hot. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But, uh, when you dim them down to 30% or so, they, they last forever and-, and uh, Yeah. I'm, how are you dimming them? Cause a lot, like I didn't bring any heaters with me cause I don't love them. But like any of the heater things that you screw the, the light bulb into, um, they don't have a dimmer on them. Well, instead of having a light switch on the wall, you put a dimmer in. And, and that is controlling a plug in the ceiling where you then plug your heat lamp into and hang it down. Okay. And then it's easy control of, of, of the, the amount of heat you're putting into the area. Okay. <coughs> Perfect. You have a question as well? Yeah, go. Oh. I have a question about coop cleaning. Yep. I don't think you elaborated like how often we need to spray the place down. Two, two times a year. Is for, like if you're going to do like a deep clean, do a deep clean like twice a year. If you, ha if you know you have issues, if you've had issues with parasites or mites in the past, you're gonna wanna do it probably for a year, you're gonna wanna do it at least once a month um, just so that you're disrupting their hatching cycle. Um, but if, if you're not struggling with parasites or, or mites or anything, you, like twice, twice a year for deep clean and otherwise it's just the regular like remove your dirty bedding and put fresh stuff in. Okay, so how often would you remove the old bedding, say in the more temperate seasons, not in the winter? Um, it's gonna depend on how many birds you have and how big your coop is. So for me, I have quite a few birds, but they're on, they're, they only ever sleep in there at night. Um, during the day, they're always outside because that's where their food sources are. Um, so I don't know, once a month I would go in maybe if, if I needed to in the summer hardly at all and then so like spring and winter I find it or sorry spring and spring and fall a little bit more um, summer I don't know once a month and in the winter I'm only going to do it once or twice because I actually want that thick warm bedding that's kind of fermenting and gross but it's producing heat so 
It's composting, yeah. And then it all goes on my garden. So, um, well, it actually goes in a pile opposite and I let it sit for six months and then it goes on my garden so that I don't have issues. So, anyone else have any questions? Otherwise, we'll, you had a question? Um, the diatomaceous earth that you were talking about. Diatomaceous earth. Could you come up to the, sorry. I'm gonna, I know, but it, then the recording won't catch it at all. With the diatomaceous earth, like for mites and everything, just to be safe, can you actually put that in their feed? Or would you just spread it somewhere? Uh, you can put, I, I think you can put it in their feed. If you have a place where they can dust, that's going to be the very best because okay. they're going to dust it all over themselves. Uh, diatomaceous, you want to make sure it's a food grade diatomaceous earth. Yeah, it's um, I use it for the garden. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah like it, should, it should say... Uh, it should say whether it's food grade or not on it. Yeah, I think it's um, food grade. But you really want to be careful yourself because it's it's really hard on your lungs. So you definitely don't want to be breathing that in. Okay. Um, so I've had it before where I just we went in the coop and we just kind of like took scoops of it and kind of threw it like along oh. the walls, on their roofs, okay. in the nesting boxes. Just kind of coat everything. Okay. Um, and they'll just kind of muck it around, right? Okay. But then then anything. Uh, it's going to go in there um, and kill off any, any parasites or bugs or anything okay, like that. Perfect. You got to come up to the, you got to come up. Can't I can give him a hard time. You got to wait. <laughs> Just quickly. When you have one of these, yeah. you can't uh, reduce the temperature. You know, they say, okay, once they're this age, reduce the temperature to this and da, 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 da. Less but of them are going to fit under this as they get bigger. So the way you reduce your temperature is you just raise it up whoops it does come right out so then you're just going to have it higher so they self-regulate basically they, they kind of self-regulate and then i just kind of take it out uh, and then i put them outside okay thanks Ooh. Oh, i just wanted to say that uh if they eat the day tomaceous earth it helps with uh worms as yep. well as pumpkin yes yeah, if they, if you, if, as they eat the diatomaceous earth, if they have any internal parasites, that's going to take care of that. Um, I, I mean, we can eat it too. If you have internal parasites, that's the natural remedy for that. But also, Jane had said pumpkins, um, pumpkin seeds are a natural uh, antiparasitic. So, and we do that in the fall. Everyone throws out their pumpkins, we collect it, and everybody on our farm eats them. Um, so I know that everyone's getting a good dewormer once, once a year. If I want to free range my chicken, so I'm, I'm, I ordered a dozen ready to lay hens for June. We have two acres. How do I know that they're going to come back and know, like, so how would I introduce them to that and train yeah. them to come back? So you, I'm assuming you have a coop for them. We will when June yeah. comes. <laughs> so it seems really mean, but you're going to lock it in the coop for a week or two. Oh, okay. You're going to okay. make sure they have lots of clean water. It's going to be a nice, clean coop. Yeah. Um, you're going to want to lock them in there. Um, so that they know that is home. This is where okay. feed is. This is where my water is. This is where I roost. Get them used to it. Okay. Um, and then let them out for the day. And then make sure, it, you might have to do it for a week, is you kind of like gather them in, lock them back up at night, yeah. right? They're, they're going to get used to the, the, the rhythm really, really quickly. You're going to open it up in the morning. They're going to go up. You're going to go to close it up. They'll all be roosting. Okay. So, but yeah, locking them up for a little bit is okay. the best way to go about it. Awesome. Yeah. So. Anybody else? We're all good? Okay, we will have a question and answer period at the end as well. So if you're thinking about something, um, that'll be really handy. So we are going to do, nope, a, a really quick break. I, there is coffee and refreshments, and I think there's goodies this time uh, out on the back table. So you guys can go grab something there, and then we'll be back in 15 minutes.